Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. Just a couple of months ago, there was terrible flooding in southern Louisiana from what the New York Times called apocalyptic rainfall, as much as two feet in just 48 hours. The storm got very little national attention. 13 people were killed and 55,000 homes were destroyed. Even the governor, John Bell Edwards, had to flee the area with his family. Ordinarily, you can't attribute a specific weather event to climate change. But there does seem to be evidence that the extraordinary intensity of this storm was the result of warming atmospheric and oceanic temperatures. Are we approaching a point of no return when it comes to global warming? We'll talk about this and other climate matters with my guest, Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, a professor of geosciences and international affairs at Princeton and one of the world's foremost experts on climate change. Michael, welcome. Glad to be here, Great Bob. Great to have you. So first, bring us up to speed on what's been happening with global temperatures. It seems like we have uh, record high temperatures month after month. So one question is, are we on uh, pace to be the, the warmest year ever in 2016? Well, 2014 was the warmest year ever, and then 2015 was warmer <laughs> than that, and 2016 is apparently on pace to be another record warm year either just as warm as last year or a little bit warmer. So this is just the continuation of a long-term trend that's been going on for more than 100 years. Earth is warming. Most of the warming is due to the buildup of carbon dioxide and other so-called greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They come from burning coal oil and natural gas. We're doing it to ourselves. So in addition to the warming and then the seas are rising, we see glaciers melting, ice sheets are melting. Uh, worldwide. Actually, at times, it seems like the planet is changing right before our eyes. Um, so when the, when the scientists look at these changes, what, what are they seeing and how do they interpret it? Well, we are remaking the face of the earth through climate change. And to go to your point about Louisiana, in fact, very new science does allow us to identify the relationship between many types of climate extremes, like intense rainfall or heat waves and the buildup of these gases in the atmosphere. So for instance, that event was about 40% more intense than it would have been without the human-made effect in the atmosphere. Right. So we know we're changing the climate. We can point to specific events sometimes, which we're partly responsible for, and which in some cases are killing people. We've got to bring this under control quickly, or else the climate is going to spin out of control, and we're just not going to be able to handle it. So uh, when I talk to people about um, climate change, which actually is not that often, uh, but when I do, I try to get to the issue of what it means for ordinary individuals, what the consequences are going to be, and especially when, when you're talking politics, people talk about what's going to happen with their kids and with their mm -hmm. grandchildren. So talk about some of the consequences for human beings if this continues at the pace it's continuing. The, the simplest thing to understand is that heat kills. People die in heat waves all the time, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And one thing we're almost sure about is the frequency of very intense heat waves is gonna increase. And in fact, we could have, uh, by the end of the century, places in the United States where it's simply not safe to be outside during parts of the summer because it's so hot and so much humidity in the atmosphere. We've got sea level rise happening, which is making coastal flooding a m a more common along the coast. This is a change that's already happening. It's going to get more and more common in the future. A storm that causes the flooding of the sort that Hurricane Sandy caused which happens maybe once every 500 years now in the northeastern United States, could happen 100 years or even 50 years from now, every 20 years, every 10 years, maybe even more frequently. So we are changing the fundamental aspects of climate that allow us to live a stable and, in this country, relatively wealthy life. We shouldn't undermine that so casually. We need to start taking measures to cut the gases before things get to, before it gets too late to avoid a real crisis. Carbon dioxide levels have um, reached the 400 parts per million threshold right. uh, in the atmosphere. Um, what does that mean and why is that um, a significant development? Well, that's about 40 or 45 percent above what carbon dioxide levels were during pre-industrial times before we started with, the, with coal burning and the steam engine, for instance. And that level is also much higher than the carbon dioxide levels have been for millions and millions of years. 
So we have, and, and the third point is we know carbon dioxide levels like that are bound to change the climate and the climate's already changing. So this gives us a benchmark for how serious the change has already been. We know with that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that ultimately we have to get a warming of probably at least three degrees Fahrenheit, which gets us very close to the danger zone, which scientists think is somewhere around four degrees Fahrenheit. So we've been watching these issues, even though I think the um, press has underplayed it and the politicians, for the most part, have not paid close enough attention, but, but we've been watching this stuff for a long time now, and then there's been a lot of evidence. Why is it, why do you think it's been so difficult to get people to understand how serious a threat this is? Climate change for a long time had been a rather abstract problem that was going to play out in the future. I mean, the theory was developed in 1896. And so even when you got to the 1950s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, we started to see that Earth was warming, but there wasn't any big effect from it. But for the last 15 or 20 years, scientists have identified things happening, for instance, the coral reefs, the Great Barrier Reef is dying. Forests in the western United States are being eaten up by bugs that basically wouldn't be able to over overwinter if the climate weren't getting right. warmer. We're getting sea level rise everywhere, which is causing excess coastal flooding, and we're getting more and more heat waves. These are effects which people are seeing in their own backyards. So things are changing. It's no longer an abstract thing for the future. It's happening now in our world. And we're seeing a change in the way politicians look at this problem. President Obama has made it a lead part of his legacy that he wants to start solving the problem. And he, in fact, has put it in place very strong regulations to start limiting these gases from motor vehicles and from electric power plants, the two biggest sources. Most encouraging to me was that Hillary Clinton made it a big campaign issue in a very close state, Florida, and went after local politicians, in particular Senator Rubio, who's running for re-election, right for not taking the climate issue seriously. So I think we've reached a tipping point politically where instead of climate change being something you could either like shrug or laugh at or put off to the side, it's now an issue on which politicians are going to survive or not survive, depending on which side of the line they're on. And Florida, li literally and figuratively, is in the path of all the things that you're talking about. Florida and Miami in particular have a grim future unless we slow the warming down quickly and unless they take some measures to defend themselves. So not only is it sort of a hurricane alley, right. and there's a, a, an expectation that, that the biggest hurricanes, the most intense ones, categories four and five, are going to get more intense. And we know whether they do or not that coastal flooding is going to increase because of sea level rise. But in addition to that, Miami sits on limestone. You couldn't even build a seawall around Miami to protect it if you had to because the water like pushes down, gets underneath and comes up like as if in a sponge wow. because the, the, the ground isn't basically solid enough to protect the city. So they need to get on this immediately. Uh, climate change has to be a primary worry for Florida and you're seeing that concern develop in local politicians. So you mentioned President Obama. Um, he, of course, uh, on climate change, as with many other issues, has faced the obstructionism of the Republican Party. Overall, how well do you think the administration has done on the climate change issue, and what's, what's been effective and what's maybe been disappointing to you? Actually, on the whole, they've done very well, better than I actually had any hope for. As I said already, they've uh, implemented, without having to go to Congress, under the authority given by a Supreme Court decision in 2007, the, uh, con tough controls on new motor vehicles, automobiles and trucks, for instance. Number two, they, it is basically no longer possible to build a power plant in the future which burns coal unless some new technology is invented which can keep the carbon dioxide from the coal burning from going up in the atmosphere. And most important, uh, the president has taken international leadership, which has totally changed the attitude towards other countries. He, he, got, uh, he reached an agreement with China, the world's biggest carbon dioxide emitter, right. that the U.S., the second biggest emitter, and China would get together and commit to specific targets to cut their emissions. And that agreement made possible 
the treaty that was signed in Paris, actually called an agreement, not a treaty, that was signed in Paris in December of last year, which commits all countries to specific efforts to cut their emissions. Now, now this agreement is essentially a, a, a voluntary agreement. Um, and most of uh, what I've been uh, reading and talking to people about it, people are, are very hopeful <laughs> that this, this agreement will uh, work mm -hmm. um, to some significant right. extent. Um, why the optimism when it's a voluntary agreement? Why, why do we think that you know, one or many parties won't just backslide? Well, I'm personally, I withhold total optimism about this agreement. <laughs> I've been around the block too many times right. on climate change, and I've seen efforts like this fail. But it is a good step forward for the first time. All countries, meaning not just rich, developed countries like the U.S. and Europe, but developing and relatively poorer countries like India, for instance, right. are committed to cutting their emissions. So we'll see if it's going to work. It is, as you say, basically voluntary, at least those commitments are. And we're going to see in the next year or two whether the countries take interim measures, which lead us to believe that they are actually going to execute the plans to cut their emissions that they committed to in Paris. So, for instance, there are provisions which would let one country judge whether another country is actually meeting its commitment by the countries having to report in some clear and transparent form how much their emissions were five years ago, how much they are today, how much they expect to be in the future. If those what are called transparency provisions are not written down in themselves a clear way which lets countries actually do the accounting, then I'm not going to trust the agreement. We'll see. There are meetings that are going on uh, this year, next year. If by two years from now it's not clear that the countries develop rules that they have to stick by, then the agreement probably isn't going to be a success. But I'm, as of today, relatively hopeful. I think countries mean it. And the reason I think countries mean it is because every country on earth is going to be victimized by this, and finally, almost every political leader on earth realizes it. A lot of people who should know better are, are what they're calling um, climate change or global warming deniers, um, um, some contending um, that uh, the temperatures are rising, but it's not the result of human activity, some claiming even that this is a hoax, um, et cetera, et cetera. The Chinese cetera. plot. The Chinese plot, exactly. Uh, a certain presidential candidate contending yes. that. Um, but who are these folks who are the climate change deniers? And, and I'm not talking about ordinary people. I'm talking about uh, business people or commentators who should know better, uh, people at uh, think tanks and, and, and a lot of politicians. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what are they basing it on? What's their agenda? Do they, even, do they truly believe what they're saying? Uh, some believe it, some don't. It's a mixture, and it's a mixture of motivations. And I just want to say at the beginning that in this world, anybody who doesn't believe science really isn't <laughs> thinking clearly. Right. Our world runs on science <laughs> these days. You can't just take a big chunk of the science like climate change and say, well, I'm, I'm going to choose not to believe it. Everybody anymore. who uses a cell phone oh, yeah. has invested in science and scientific accuracy. Right. And you go to the doctor, yeah. and they aren't perfect, <laughs> but you try to follow what they're suggesting right. because your life depends on it. Well, in a very general way, all our lives depend on following climate science. So what we're seeing here is a mixture of some people who, and I think this is the main thing, dealing with climate change requires not only government regulation, but international cooperation. And if there are two things that a big chunk of, say, the Republican right doesn't believe in, it's government regulation right. and international cooperation. I think that's the biggest <laughs> part of the problem. Then that kind of belief structure is fed by certain industries, particularly the fossil fuel purveyors, like the, some oil companies and the coal companies that know their bread and butter is going to be pulled out of their mouths, basically, if things are done about climate change in a serious way. I think that is the bulk of the problem. You add into that the fact that this is a headache, and people have enough headaches in their lives, and they don't <laughs> like to get up and have to worry about something else. Right. So, that combination has caused a problem, but I think the, the, uh, the pattern is shifting. I think that more and more responsible leaders are belling up to the bar and deciding we have to do something about this. And it's changing, and I have every confidence that the U.S. leadership will continue 
particularly if the next administration is one that's committed to solving the problem. Yeah, you mentioned Hillary Clinton pushing this issue uh, in her campaign, right. and especially um, in Florida. That's correct. And that um, leads me to ask, do you, do you see a, a difference in the approach to climate issues uh, and maybe to environmental issues in general? Um, do you see a generational divide, a generational difference? Oh, absolutely. Can you I, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, I teach college. <laughs> I'm around young people all the time. Right. And my own kids, who are still fairly young. And it's just for them, it's like it's natural. It's, it's not, you know, they're, they don't disbelieve science. They automatically believe it because they grew up in a world right. which was, in, you know, they're saturated with this kind of thing. So their presumption is that this is a problem that the leaders better deal with. And you see this in polls and you see the split, which is largely generational. So that's a good reason to be encouraged. Uh, it, you know, if as time goes on, as these people, the young ones, age into becoming the leaders of the world, right. this problem is bound to get dealt with. The question is, well, we can't really wait that long. How much damage will be done if we wait that long? Therefore, we need the current leadership to not wait to get up and do their job. Right, but if the young people do get on board in larger and larger numbers, you will see a cultural change. We've seen it on a lot of other issues, and that yeah, would that's be a right. big deal. Uh, young people ought to get out there and vote, not just for president, but for leaders that make this a key issue. Right, so um, you said that we need um, more governmental action, more international cooperation. Uh, thinking in terms of the U.S., what are some of the things that we, as a, a nation, as a society, need to be doing that we're not doing? Well, there's a revolution going on in the energy sector. That is, electricity is less and less produced by burning coal anyway, more and more produced by cheaper natural gas and, remarkably, by solar and wind energy. And what we need to do is encourage those developments so that there are, for, and for instance, to really make solar and wind energy effective because it's intermittent, you need a new type of electricity grid. So one of the key areas now is for the federal and state governments to get together because it's an interstate grid right. and redesign the U.S. transmission system so that solar and wind energy can penetrate as effectively as possible. That requires leadership at the federal level. It requires the electricity companies getting together in a cooperative way with the government. And I think that that's the number one thing really that needs to be done. We need to also spend a lot more money on research and development to keep, because one of the areas that we need to uh, push forward on is what's called storage, essentially advanced batteries or similar technologies because the sun isn't up at night to store <laughs> the, en the electricity for those periods or when it's cloudy. And through those actions and then on the regulatory side, toughening the regulations which the Obama administration put in on electric power plants and on automobiles, keep the incentive for new technologies to be coming online which are emission free. What would happen if we just sort of keep going along as we're going along now, not doing much more, not doing much less? What would you think the consequences would be? If we do just sort of what we committed to do at Paris, which is really only a first step, and the U.S. committed to cut its emissions by about 28 percent by the year 2030, similar reductions by many other countries. If we did that and nothing more, we'd get to a world toward the end of the century which was maybe, uh, maybe five or six degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Whoa. That would be unacceptably warm. It'd be warmer than the world has been in many millions of years. Again, record heat waves, higher sea level, ecosystems dying all over the, over the place, human health undermined. Uh, starting to, there's new research which shows that excess heat affects labor productivity. You would see a comprehensive effect which would degrade not only quality of life and human health, but the U.S. economy. We can't let that happen. So governments of the world decided, well, when you get to a warming of around three, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, global average. That's where the real danger point is and you start seeing a concatenation of bad effects. So emissions policy not only has to do 
what we committed to in Paris, but uh, implement much deeper cuts. So for instance, for the U.S., the ultimate target in about 2050 is an 80 percent reduction in emissions, wow. which is beyond the 28 percent, and then eliminating our dependence on fossil fuels totally somewhere in the second half of the century. But if we keep doing what we're doing, the consequences essentially would be catastrophic. Eventually, I believe they would be disastrous. What would it mean for um, the, the New York area, say New York City, Long Island, New Jersey, with the extensive shoreline? What would people in the New York, New York and its vicinity see with the significant additional warming? Well, in the worst case scenarios, sea level rise eventually, and we don't know if it would be toward the end of the century or more likely somewhat beyond, would be so substantial that we would have to build a permanent seawall to protect Manhattan. And for large parts of Brooklyn and Queens, it's impossible, basically. We couldn't afford to do it because it would be too big a seawall and people would have to retreat. And that's one wow. thing people are gonna to have to get used to in any event. There are just certain areas of the coast where we're not gonna be able to afford to defend. And we're just gonna to have to move back people, create buffer zones, let certain areas return to wetlands and to uh, sand barriers, uh, barrier beaches, and just leave well enough alone. If we can keep the warming below three, four degrees Fahrenheit, there's a good chance that those areas will be relatively limited. But if we let this thing spin out of control, Hurricane Sandy will look like a party compared wow. to what we're going to get. You mentioned what we need to do at the governmental level. What can um, individuals do? You know, we're, we're in a light bulb revolution. For <laughs> instance, it's, it, it, the old incandescent bulbs are going out because they were very inefficient. Right. Most of their, 95% of the energy they generated was heat, not light. That doesn't help. So we, we've got new light bulbs now, the LEDs basically, which are somewhat more expensive, but they last much longer and use a quarter as much energy. You should go through your house and not, not wait for the bulbs to burn out, but replace them to the extent you can afford it with LEDs because it winds up saving you money on your electricity bill. And it's a big deal. When you go to buy a car, buy the car that gets the highest fuel economy in the size class that you need. And there are cars now that get very, you know, 50, 60 miles a gallon. Go for those cars. And those mileage is gonna be getting better in the future. The higher the mileage, the higher uh, the, the, uh, the higher the mileage, the lower the gasoline use, the lower the carbon dioxide emissions. Right. And if you know, the most important thing, vote. Vote. We I've vote been telling for, people. That's it. <laughs> and you made the point earlier, which I think is such an essential point. Not just in the presidential election. No. You need to vote in state and local elections. And, you know, it, it really makes well, a difference. Well, vote on down issues. ballot. Yeah. And, and, and ask your politics. You know, there's, they're vulnerable and they're sensitive to public opinion. Ask them what they're doing about this problem. Let them know you're worried about it. Now, um, I know that you tend ultimately to be optimistic uh, on this issue. That way, you, you, you bring the bad news and then you tell us, you know, yeah, but I'm optimistic. Yeah. Uh, explain why you're optimistic and, and, and why we should be hopeful um, that we can cope with this, that we can deal with it. One is, I just have a sort of an optimistic view of humanity, despite what you read, <laughs> you read every day, in that we, we do create problems for ourselves, but then we seem to be able to get smart fat, uh, at some point and muddle through them and get to a solution. We're very smart in creating difficulties. For instance, the, the brilliance of the technology of burning fossil fuels allowed us to reach a certain level of wealth we're smart enough to fix it up. Right. We see every day these massive developments in renewable energy, in efficiency, in living in patterns. For instance, people are starting to live more in the cities again, which cuts greenhouse gas emissions. Cities are more efficient. We're seeing humans move towards patterns of settlement which are compatible with a new world where we don't warm the planet as much. I see those as exciting new possibilities. I see the possibility of getting rid of coal and, bur and using solar energy as, hey, that's a brilliant, clean, <laughs> world. So, you know, I just hope, you know, we can get there before I'm too old to appreciate it. All right. We're going to stop on that optimistic note. Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, thank you so much. Glad to be here. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word.
Several weeks ago, Brooklyn District Attorney Kenneth Thompson agreed to be a guest on this program. A few days later, his office called to say he was ill and would have to reschedule. On Sunday, October 9th, came the awful word that Ken Thompson had died of cancer at the age of 50. It's a great loss. Thompson was a true reformer. In one of his most important initiatives, he re-examined questionable convictions secured by his predecessor, Charles Hines. In more than 20 of those cases, wrongful convictions for murder or other serious crimes were overturned. Thompson refused to prosecute most low-level marijuana cases, and his office was committed to the difficult task of improving police community relations. Ken Thompson was an important example of a sane and effective approach to criminal justice, something we desperately need in these troubled times. All of us here at op-ed.tv offer our condolences to Thompson's wife, LaShawn, and their two sons. That's all for now. I'll see you next time.